Uh, welcome, everyone, to today's lecture by Madeleine Gannon, Breathing Life into Machines. Uh, I have a couple of things, like just some kind of um, logistics and, and bits and pieces to kind of go through first, and then I'll, I'll introduce Madeleine in just a second. Um, but I want to kind of note that um, this kind of, uh, this workshop, um, or sorry, this talk is part of a larger kind of weekend of activities through uh, the School of Architecture's public programs. And we're delighted to have not just Madeline here, but a number of other uh, folks joining for kind of a weekend of explorations of computing and uh, the relationship um, that we have with computation as well. Um, so we're thrilled to host Madeline, uh, also Vernell Noel, who joined us uh, for a lecture earlier this afternoon and is kind of faculty here in the School of Architecture. Uh, Jake Marsico, um, who's from Deep Local, who'll be running kind of a workshop this weekend on light and code. And Audrey Desjardins, uh, who is joining us from the University of Washington and we'll be running a uh, workshop on small data and zine making tomorrow as well. Um, so the workshops will also culminate, I think I have a note on this, we have a couple of different workshops that I've kind of quickly run through here. And then uh, if you would like to join us on Sunday to kind of see the products of those workshops, we're having um, a kind of a gathering uh, between 11 and 1 p.m. Uh, where we'll kind of get together. Uh, talk about the work and kind of um, see what each of the workshops uh, prepared as well. Um, so uh, that's uh, starting at 11 a.m. Uh, we'll have a short kind of report out from each of the workshops um, and then we'll move into kind of just an open discussion with lunch uh, at about noon as well. That will take place between here in the Studio of Creative Inquiry and CFA 214 which is just uh, up on the other side of the building uh, uh, kind of one floor up and Oh, no, it is directly up here. Sorry, yes, I'm getting kind of, um, I am getting a little turned around. Um, just before we kind of move into the talk, uh, because we have a lot of kind of things happening this weekend, I just want to acknowledge a whole bunch of people who have made this possible, uh, both in kind of generous support and in kind of logistics and, and kind of thinking through the program as well. So uh, CMU's Open Source Programs Office, uh, the Computational Design Program and the School of Architecture more generally. And a big kind of thank you to the Studio for Creative Inquiry, the Frank Ratchie Studio for Creative Inquiry, and all the staff here in kind of making Madeline's uh, kind of workshop, lecture, and more besides so smooth. So thank you, Nika, Bill, Harrison, uh, Carol, and Linda for all the kind of the work here and making it so easy to kind of put events together here as well. Um, so that is kind of all of the thank yous. Oh, almost all the thank yous. I wanted to also recognize Sarah Rafson, who's not here at the moment, who is our curator of public programs, and has put an enormous amount of time, energy, and thought into making this workshop series possible uh, as well. All right, now to the main event. Um, I think as an alumni of the Computational Design Program, our PhD program here, uh, and as a resident of the Studio for Creative Inquiry for many, many hours, weeks, days, and months while, while kind of doing that research, um, I couldn't think of a more fitting venue and a fitting format and a fitting set of programs to kind of welcome Madeline back uh, to CMU. So it's really exciting to have you here, and it's really exciting to have you in this format. And this is the point where I'm just going to read from my notes uh, to get your bio exactly right. Uh, Dr. Madeleine Gannon is a multidisciplinary designer blending techniques in art, design, computer science, and robotics to forge new futures for human-robot relations. Also known as the Robot Whisper Whisperer, <laughs> Uh, Gannon specializes in convincing robots to do things that they were never intended to do. From transforming giant industrial robots into living, breathing mechanical creatures, to taming hordes of autonomous machines to behave like a pack of animals. Dr. Gannon is a World Economic Forum cultural leader, a Knight Foundation awardee, a former robotics and AI researcher at NVIDIA, and a former artist in residence at ETH Zurich. Autodesk Pier 9, and the Carnegie Mellon Studio of Creative Inquiry. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> she is known as one of the top 10 women in the robotics industry and the world's 50th, uh, 50, among the uh, world's 50th, 50 most renowned women in robotics, according to Analy Analytics Insight. Man uh, Madeline Gannon holds a Master of Architecture from Florida International University and a PhD in Computational Design from Carnegie Mellon. Please join me in welcoming Madeline Gannon. Uh, 
Uh, I'm, I'm so happy to be here um, to share a little bit of my passion, to share a little bit of my, the parts of me that were really formed in this room uh, with the people in this room and, and uh, with, uh, I'm just grateful to be here. Thank you for having me. It's really exciting. Uh, this, this is going to be, this is going to be a little nostalgic. Um, so uh, a lot of the work that I do, I, you know, I'm known for my work in robotics. It is not really what I intended to be known for. It just sort of kind of fell into it. And really what I was doing was taking some of the things I was learning in uh, computational design and all the computer science classes I was taking over there and thinking about interaction instead of automation. So we're going to talk a lot about robots today, um, about how I work to convince them to listen to me and, uh, and not just command them to do what I want. And I think this is a really apt metaphor for how we interact with technology in the future as we work to make it more intelligent and more autonomous, to give it agency to do things in the world, we're giving up direct control of it. And so we have to uh, listen a little bit better and we have to um, be able to say what they need to hear in order to get them to do what we want. Um, and so everything really began here in this room for me uh, in my desk up there. I was a little bit of a, a black sheep in the School of Architecture, really beginning to explore robotics, not for building things, but just them as individual creatures doing their own thing. And the studio was my refuge for that. Um, it's where my imagination was stretched. It's where I discovered my voice. It's where I learned I deserved to have a voice. And it's where I learned how to make cool shit. So I'm grateful to be here. And I want to start with a non-robotics project. This was, this was actually, this was done 10 years ago this month. So it's, it's interesting to reach an age where you can remember things from 10 years ago. Um, but I want to mention this because this was actually funded by the Studio for Creative Inquiry. Has anyone ever received a fur FAF grant? For, I love seeing that. I love seeing that. Okay, this is a plug for a fur FAF grant because this project changed my life. It was the first time I did any work that got noticed by anyone that wasn't related to me. And um, for FAF, they grant micro grants under $500 or in major grants into the thousands of dollars. And it's for faculty, it's for staff, and it's especially for students. So um, this was a part of a, a $1,200 grant. And um, it, it like, resulted in opportunities in New York Fashion Week. Um, it got my work noticed. You know, so when you Google my name, it's not just my like, LinkedIn that pops up. And it made a whole lot of friendships that I still carry with me to this day. So apply, apply, apply. That's the end of my plug. But it also is still like a lot of the tricks that I learned doing this project is what I applied to robotics. So um, I was about two semesters in in learning how to program. I, I came to Carnegie Mellon because I did not get into a curatorial program that I really, I really wanted to be a curator about. I was really interested in this digital stuff, but I didn't know how to do any of it. And so uh, I didn't get in there, but I did get into Carnegie Mellon. I don't know how, but I did. And with that, you learn a lot of technical things. And this was about two semesters of technical work where um, this was maybe like the first time I was able to apply it in, towards something more design related. And I made this little squid that I could reach into the computer and interact with and uh, let it sort of drag it around a 3D scan of my own body. And for me, it was like, it was scratching this itch of, you know, how can I make things, these niche tools that can do things that mass market computational design tools just can't do. And it was uh, very cool to, to start to think about how I could have control over you know, making something that becomes a prosthetic for my imagination. So when I started doing this project, what happened was I was actually for a class in Golan Levin's class. It was for interactive art and computational design. I was a master's student at the time. And I, I was making this little squid thing, and I forgot to clear my array. And so it just kept on copy, 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 copy. And I realized, oh, this looks cool. And then I said, well, I wonder if I could print that. And lo and behold, it just printed and, and, and worked. Um, and it, it, the, the studio allowed me to make these physical. It just so happened to be at a time where there were online services for printing uh, larger things, body scale things. And so the, the FURFAF grant was able to allow me to sort of get my work out of the computer and into the physical world. And, and all the while I was also playing around with robots. So if you don't know, the building over there, Margaret Morrison, in the third sub-basement, 
below, like where the trolls live, also live a bunch of robots. And at the time um, that we had them, no one really knew how to use them. Uh, and so it was, it was amazing because you knew as much as the instructor for uh, playing with them. So there was no one to tell you like, hey, you shouldn't make a robot that gives you a back massage. And, and it led to a passion within me to really begin to explore how to properly misuse these machines. Uh, and I wanted to, again, build these tools that let you sketch uh, in real time with this really complicated technology. So the idea with all of this is that how can we build tools that remove all the friction between this crazy idea in your head and trying it out in the real world? And robots in particular, I, I think, is a, a really interesting cultural medium to work with. We have such a rich narrative around robotics and pop culture. Um, but I think that there's a lot more room for imagination. You know, when you close your eyes and you think of robots, m chances are, like, maybe you think of uh, Rosie from the Jetsons, and, like, this is the future that we expect to have. And then uh, the way that I see it, though, it's not nearly as interesting as, the, like, the present that we actually have with these machines, right? And you think about, like, these stories that we have from 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, these are stories that, like, made by imaginative people, the most creative minds of our time, and it doesn't match the exciting reality of what we have today. And so I see that, you know, the stories that we have of our future are really from our past, and it's up to everyone in this room to start writing new ones. I'm really passionate about inventing better ways to communicate with machines that can make things. For a long time, industrial robots have been the culprit of automation and replacing human labor. Basically, all the easy tasks to automate have been automated. Now what we're working on is um, using these tools to enhance or augment human labor. And that to me is very exciting. Industrial robots are really fantastic CNC machines. You put a different tool at the end of the arm and all of a sudden they can do a whole different thing. So in the morning you can be doing spot welding, in the evening you can be doing painting. It's just highly adaptable. Another thing that I'm working towards is finding ways to bring these machines out of factories and into live environments. So onto construction sites or onto film sets. There's chance for unpredictable objects like people to be moving into the environment. That's one of the reasons why I wanted to build the system to give this robot eyes so that it could actually see me and we can safely collaborate in a shared space. If I'm wearing or if I'm holding these motion capture markers, and it knows where I am in space, it knows how I'm moving in space, now all of a sudden we can give the machine a nuanced understanding of our intention in that space. You can get someone who's never seen a robot before and have them begin to do creative things with just a couple minutes of interacting with the machine. And projects like this for me, represents some of the superpowers that uh, we can bring as designers, as artists, as architects to technological fields, right? This was a really, like, an obvious project to me where you have a machine that can move in the world but not see, and these motion capture sensors that can see but not move, and let me just make some digital duct tape that lashes those systems together. Um, and so, for me, it was asking this machine that was built to do short, repetitive tasks to be improvisational, uh, to be open. And uh, I knew that that was the effect that I was having on the robot. I was programming to do that. But I was really surprised at the effect that this orange robot had on me. And after spending, you know, like weeks and days with this big orange robot, um, it began to feel less and less like, like a machine, like this infrastructure, and more and more like this like animal that I was taming and, and hoping that it uh, wouldn't crush me. Um, and so the idea of this is, is, is also that like, uh, I didn't really, didn't, I didn't set out to make this project. It's something that through like continuous curiosity of trying things in public as well, that that was the feedback that I was receiving from the world that everyone was more excited about. This is actually demo code that I was doing for a different project. But everyone was more excited about this relationship that I was having with this machine. 
than what I was doing with it. And I think it's productive to think about a robot as anything with a mechanical mind and mechanical muscles. And I'm gonna talk a lot about robot arms here, but if you use this wider definition, you can see that a lot of these machines are already amongst us. Um, from working in warehouses, self-driving vehicles here in Pittsburgh has been pioneering that, delivery robots to toys, or even 3D printers are a form of robotics. Um, and you're likely to bump into them on your daily basis. And they're really fascinating because these machines with their superhuman speed and, and superhuman strength and accuracy and precision and endurance, um, they leave these really, really boring lives, all these superpowers trapped in a factory uh, doing nothing but short repetitive tasks. And they also are this beautiful symbol of everything that we tend to fear about technology, like namely our, our, our own obsolescences at that heart of that fear. So I, I like working with it as an off-the-shelf medium to begin to subvert some of our expectations that we have with this machine. Some, some really interesting things that happened at the beginning of where, where robotics began to intersect people was in the late 50s and 60s. And there was also at the very same time some amazing experiments happening in art as well for these things. From cybernetic serendipity to experiments in art and technology, there were people that were focusing on these machines for um, efficiency and optimization and repetition, you know, kind of doing things that were dirty, dusty, and dull. And then there were other people at the very same time thinking about machines that could be curious or could be kind or could be alive. And so a lot of the work that I do tries to go back in time to the 1960s and travel down that alternate timeline to see what if we've had 50 years of growth and development of robots that were kind and curious and alive. And so let me introduce you to Mimas. Mimas here, uh, she had uh, a six month holiday at the Design Museum in London. So she was on a factory line in Birmingham. The museum invited me to do an installation and so we brought her in here to just come to the museum and exist and live amongst all the visitors. And it's interesting how, you know, something that's so alien from our own biology can still seem so lifelike just by the way it moves. And I see this machine as showing us kind of a, uh, a reflection of our own humanity in some ways, right? It's really this, this empty vessel that we pour meaning into. And at its core, when you look at it and it looks back at you, you start to lay this foundation for connection instead of direct control. And uh, thinking about like, what if our technology was curious about us? In, um, and to do this project, the first thing I worked with, also a fellow alumni of the Studio for Creative and Greek, Kevin McPhail, to modify some off-the-shelf technology. So we're using off-the-shelf robot. These are off-the-shelf V1 Microsoft Connects that cost you know, $18 on Amazon. And I bought like 20 of them. And we made a, a, a sensing system that would let Mimas see a whole crowd of people. So instead of me holding a marker in a lab setting, thinking about what, how can we give this machine an actual personality to see and respond to visitors just like any other living creature would. And so this is kind of how she sees folks. You, she has a bird's eye view looking down and she sees these blobs about how tall you are, how active you are, how long you've been there. And just from those numeric values, we can start to make assumptions. For example, if you've been there for a long time and you're getting closer, maybe you've built a bond, you've built trust and Mima should go visit you first. Or if you're really, really short and really hyperactive, maybe you're a fun kid and we should definitely go hang out with you because the boring adults are no fun. And that was really the challenge, like how do you turn this one ton pile of metal and motors into a living, breathing mechanical creature? And part of that is also letting her be indifferent to the people around her. So if you're boring, she'll get bored and she'll go away or go take a nap. And, uh, and so it's been, it's been fun to see, you know, this was one robot with a crowd of people. And then uh, just after I had an opportunity to work with the World Economic Forum to explore what it would be like for a crowd to be surrounded by robots. So now where there's like equal parity where are you, the robots are surrounding us. So Mimas is a set of 10 industrial robots, much smaller, much more agile. 
Every robot that I work with, their body is a little different. How they move is a little faster. Their motor sound a little a little different. And so I try to imbue some sense of personality with that. You know, there's the same basic um, uh, tricks of the trade, but every robot has their own personality. And I try to to tease that that out and give them what they sort of how they want to move. And for these. What, what I found really interesting is like, for these machines, we think of them, we see them as physical entities, but their minds are distributed through space, you know? And so we can think of this as 10 robots or 10 fingers of a hand. And this system uh, built on, on Nemus, but instead of looking down, it looks up. For the architects in the room, it's a worm's eye view of the world and very, very near sighted. So you have to get very close to it for them to come see you. And here we're looking for kind of the hallmarks of uh, body language, so hands, heads, how close you are, bowing, and the robots would respond and their, their behaviors would sort of waft back and forth and affect one another as well as the person they were interested in. And I think a lot about the spatial experience of technology. It's something that I think is, is going to become more and more relevant as these tools become a bit more per pervasive. But being nearsighted, uh, Mimas or Manus would draw you in. You would feel the periphery of the robots staring back at you. And um, you would start to also see reflections in this shiny box with its light table uh, reflect back at you. And when you start to embody all of these technical layers of you know, computer vision and installation on another continent and the whole engineering aspect of it, and you embody that into a spatial experience, you start to push these machines from control and towards connection. I try to think about how do we make, how do we make technology more generous? What are acts of generosity that we can expect from our technology? And for me, I think a lot about attention. More often with technology, a technology takes your attention. That's how a lot of the internet is funded, right? And can we build tools that give attention back? It's an act of generosity, an act of kindness to give someone your attention. And, uh, and for this, it, I think that there's, there's opportunity to pull out some poetry from these really, really pragmatic tools. A lot of the robots that I use are, are borrowed. And so whenever I get to like visit them in video, it, it makes me a little nostalgic too. And more recently, I've been thinking about this idea of alive. You know, we, the, the, a lot of the, the narrative around artificial intelligence and large language models and everything is really is poking at intelligence. But I think life-likeness or lifeness, life force is really, really interesting. And um, the ETH Zurich invited me uh, to come and crash their place and come and do a quick project in their robotics facility. I was really inspired by these swans uh, on Zurichsee where they, would, they were vicious. If they heard like a rustling bag of bread, they would swarm you and they would be so upset if you didn't give it to one of them. And I thought like, how can I begin to translate this experience of, of those machines that kind of reminded me of, of the robots in, in ETH as well. How can I start to embody those behaviors and that personality to take these machines that were made for automation and make them a lot more personable? The underlying technology that I, that I do is, is uh, simulation is at its core. So this project was, I had, uh, I had about a month in Zurich to do this, and this was an active lab, so lower lots of projects. So I had to do everything in simulation before, and then come drop in to the real robots and start to see uh, what was wrong, what I needed to tweak. Uh, you can simulate everything possible and still be inspired by what's happening in real life. So there's some basic gesture detection here. What I'm looking for is uh, the relationship that my body has with the machines as well as with itself. So I can detect clapping or a shooing gesture, or when I walk over to one, the other ones get jealous behind you and start to chirp behind your head. And, um, and it was a really amazing experience to, to also work with some of the uh, technicians at the space and really like show them how their technology could be misused, but in a, in a way that like they've never seen these robots operating without tools on the end of them. And so it helped unlock some creative imagination in that way. 
Um, I stole this diagram from Stuart Candy, who was faculty here in Design for All, and I love it. It's such a beautiful, beautiful view of how to think about the future. And the way that he talks about this is imagine we're standing here and we're holding a flashlight looking out into the world. And as far as we go, we see the, the probable future down the middle, the possible future, and then the fall off is the preferable. And I see the role of industry as really focusing on that probable future. And research is to identify the possible future. And the arts is really about pushing on the edge of possible and impossible to move us towards the preferable futures that we want. And so with making machines more alive, I also thought, why don't I start living with the machines? And so this is a, a warehouse that, uh, that we bought in the North Shore and Spring Garden. And, uh, and it was an insane project at an insane time in the world. Um, but I thought, like, this Pittsburgh, I have to show this project. It's really, really cool. This is, this is uh, where my child was born. we got to show this. And, and so I have, like, I have six months of blood, sweat, and tears boiled down into 45 seconds right now. Add a lot of carpet. I love this city. I love this city has given so much to me. And the idea that someone with like a little bit of gumption and uh, naivety about how hard something actually is can, can just go off and do something is pretty powerful. Um, so the warehouse house for me was really my attempt of thinking about what it's like to live with these machines, not just visit it in, in a lab uh, or, or crash overnight at the studio on the couch back there, but actually live amongst them. And what would that kind of like friction, what, what ideas would come by having that adjacency? Like the first project that I did with the necklaces, the only reason why I had that idea of actually trying to print them was because I was sitting next to a printer. And so I wanted to make a space that, that had that. So the, it was, this was laid out in, in a living space and a lab space. And, uh, and the CNC room was my favorite thing. And then we turned it into a nursery. So and the, the week after we bought the place, we found out that we we're going to have a kid. This is Lena, the biggest project to date. And uh, we got the, the place in winter. And so we're like, OK, well, we just have an indoor, indoor playground, right? And you know this act of swinging and letting her feel outside her body was very calming for her. And then I was thinking, well, wouldn't the robot like to do that too, right? Like it's always like pegged in one spot all the time, and wouldn't like to feel these forces on itself, and not just, you know, what, what was that like? And so of course we had to simulate that too. My friend Hamad made this, and uh, like <laughs> Lena is a pandemic baby, and it was it was really nice for her to have this kind of form of companionship uh, that she could start to swing with. And so I've been working more and more recently about how to explore, how to convey this essence of life and personality into our machines. And I'm not the first, right? So a lot of these things, principles of animation as well. It's like you take these abstract objects, you move them in just the right way that triggers just the right primal senses in us, and all of a sudden we see life. And I was fortunate enough to work with um, some f crazy folks in Portland that have the world's biggest robot to do this next project. So this thing, like, it reminds me of an ostrich sometimes, or maybe like a dinosaur. But this robot weighs uh, 10,000 pounds. It's 14 feet tall, just at its shoulder. And so I, I emailed my friend. I was like, hey, I just saw you got this robot. Um, can I come play? He's like, sure, come on over. So I did a one-week micro-residency there where, again, I could simulate things first here uh, and then land there and do something. And so he's like, whoa, what do you want to do? I'm like, ah, I don't really know what to do, but we should, we should do something fun, right? Let's do something fun. Let's just make a giant googly eye on it. And he's like, oh, that's such a good idea. We should totally do that. But what do you really want to do? I'm like, well, I want to make a giant googly eye on the end of it. 
And so we made a two meter big googly eye to on the end of the robot and, and here you hear it roaring at you and all that. And I have to say the amount of engineering to make the the pivot point at that pupil, because that is like out of plywood, is really heavy and the robot's holding it upside down at some point. It was like having a conference table flying in your face. You feel it, whoosh, the whoosh of air. We'll turn, we'll turn in the motors a little bit. But this is kind of what robots sound like, just so you know. <laughs> I like the sound. I like the sound. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't know how the audio was. I'm going to mute, mute that. <laughs> um, what I like about this project in particular is, is that um, it's just two circles. You know, it's a white circle and a black circle. It's this very minimalist composition. And as soon as you start to move it, our brain starts to project so much life, so much intelligence into this thing staring back at you. Um, and uh, for me, it was like, oh, I want to I wanna keep on working at the scale. Like, uh, like I'm, an, I'm an architect, right? I can do building scale things. But the idea of working with, like, I don't have the resources to do a 10,000 pound robot. And I'm like, oh, what's bigger than a 10,000 pound robot? I'm like, oh, construction cranes. That's bigger. Um, and like these things are actually this is uh, in, in Cambridge, but you know these are big giant robots that in architecture that we've been using forever, and we're kind of like neglecting them as a really powerful force for moving things through midair really fast over big spaces. And so I've been working on a new project um, to develop cable-driven robots, these micro cranes that we can control with computers. And this project was funded by the Grant Foundation, the, sorry, it was funded by the Knight Foundation last year. I've been working on it since about March, and we're, and we're going to teach a workshop on it. It's my first time teaching a workshop on it. So for all those who are attending, be patient with me. We're going to get through it together. But the idea here is that uh, to make an open source toolkit that starts to bring all of the creativity from um, people outside of robotics and get them to be able to enchant environments to life with these cable-driven robots. A lot of my favorite art installations from the past 20 years, these immersive spaces or kinetic sculptures, the secret sauce are, are cable-driven robots. And, um, and so for me, it was just an exciting thing to try to make an open source version of that so we don't have to keep on reinventing this technology over and over again and keep it to ourselves. So my pitch is that we can go a lot further uh, if we share this knowledge and, un and uncork this potential creativity, then with just, then with just uh, doing it uh, by ourselves. Let's see, is that gonna play? Oh, I turned it on mute. So in December, I did my first public projects with this. Um, this is uh, Yijin Man. She's a, fe a violinist fellow at New World Symphony in Miami. And we did this performance together for um, uh, Miami Art Week. And it was amazing. She, I met with her twice in the public performance for 300 people. It was the third time we met. And she composed, choreographed, and uh, performed this piece um, like within the whole time. And it was such a, it was my first time really collaborating with, with uh, someone outside of my field. And I was, I'm now, I'm, I'm, now I only want to work with performing artists. It was such a great experience. And of course, like we started the year with, with a, one big googly eye, and so I had to make more googly eyes there. But I think there's a lot of potential for like interactive set design, motion graphics with like physical letters, for puppeteering, uh, for, for, I don't know what, uh, musical performance to work with these machines. Uh, so this is a sneak peek. This is kind of what we're going to have. We have some of these set up here. Not fully set up yet. We're going to get them up in the morning. But uh, I built a bunch of tools that let you talk to these machines with either, with anything that you're, you're used to. If you're used to grasshopper, uh, rhino, processing, um, anything, you, anything that has OSC, you can talk to these machines. So you don't need to know anything about robotics. You just have to bring your creativity, maybe some arts and craft skills. We're going to use a lot of foam core to do cool stuff with it. And that's kind of a sneak peek for tomorrow. Thank you all. Hi, everybody. Uh, do we need intros? Yes. OK. Vernell, do you want to start? Hi, I'm Vernell Noel in the School of Architecture. 
I'm Madeline. You heard enough from me. <laughs> I'm Jake Marsico. I'm at uh, Deep Local. Great. Nice to see you all. I'm Audrey Desjardins. I am from the School of Art, Art History, and Design at um, University of Washington in Seattle and really delighted to be here with all of you. Um, it's also a fabulous way to get to know you, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and Dara, Sarah, thank you for inviting me and us um, for this fabulous weekend. Um, I have a lot of notes, but I know we don't have five hours. <laughs> so I want to start with one question that I struggle with myself in my own practice, in my own work, which is, and I think I saw that in, or not, not, the, not the struggle, but the optimism. So I saw a lot of uh, optimism in your talk, Vernell, a lot in yours also, Madeline, and from what I gathered from your work as well. <laughs> and so my question is, how do you balance this sense of optimism that you know clearly exudes from the work with a desire to still be critical about new technologies and kind of the, the futures or the ideas of the futures that we have? I, I call myself, a, I'm definitely, my personality is optimistic. I can't escape it. But I try to have, I try to be a skeptic optimist as well. And to try to, to not just see um, the technology for what it could be, but the technology for what it can do. And a lot of the work that I do, like, like I have um, many marketable technical skills, uh, and I choose not to do lots of stuff. And so there's one way of sort of steering my ship towards that preferable future it is not just what I put out in the world, but what I also don't put out in the world. Thanks. I would say as designers and artists, we are, it's our thing to be optimistic, right? We're always thinking about the future, what things can be. Um, and where the criticality comes in, I think, is also knowing the future and what things can be, um, what things have been and what we don't want anymore. Um, I also think it makes the work richer to critique your own work, to debate your work against yourself, um, to do the work that others may not want to do. I think it's our responsibility as those who imagine futures to be critical of those futures. I think we owe it to the things that we make. I mean, I, I work in advertising, so what I'm about to say is kind of <laughs> bull crap. But I, I will say, optimistic. yeah, I, I'm also an optimistic person. And I yeah. do think that, you know, um, I, what we do, in, look, we do advertising at Deep Local, but I think our goal is to always be very f fun, you know? And, and I think similar to what, um, you know, everyone else said, is that I think what, what we put out in the world as optimistic alternatives of technology is, the, is a very good form of critique. It's a very actionable form of critique. And it's saying, you know, instead of talking about these things, it's, you know, we're, 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 we're showing people alternatives, yeah. right? Uh, you know, alternative futures. Yeah, to that, it's like, I, as, a, as a collective, we really know what we don't want this technology to do, but there's not that sense of uh, collective agreement on what we do want the technology to do. So if we can start to probe out in different directions and as far and as wide as possible, that's, I think we can get to those desirable things faster. I think that's a really interesting point because I feel like I describe my work so often as an alternative. And so it's easier to say it's an alternative to the you know, big data space or to the data economy, but it's harder to name the thing, the alternative. It's harder, and I really liked your slide when you said you know, the repetitive robot, I can't remember the other ones, repetition, and then the other one was kind, alive. And so I, I'm wondering maybe do we have other terms that we wanna discuss in this context of conversations with machines? What are, what are characteristics or qualities or things we want to see in these alternatives. It, it took me a long time to settle on those words, those simple words, because you know a lot of it can be bullshit, like, oh, I want empathy, or I want this. But, but to really think about, like, what, what do I actually want? What do I have in my power to communicate or to show that as a possibility? We, we, take, we take these things, and we assume they're only for one use. But look, with, like, open source software and, and shitty sensors, I can do something completely different as a single person, right? That, that really shows that these are choices that we're making to accept this technology. And, and the artists, the designers, the, the, the people who want to have a say can help steer the ship in different directions. 
I, I think it's it's an interesting point that you know I, I'm a big fan of uh, technology driven art and it's not something that's generally kind of you know, appreciated in the larger art world and I think it's a shame because it, the opportunities for kind of future looking beauty you know I think in a very generic term um, yeah I just I, I think it's important that artists and designers and creatives in general are at in these conversations about technology, and they rarely, they, they often aren't. You know, I think in this space at CMU, that might be something that is funny to hear because art and technology is kind of central to a, a lot of conversations on this campus. But in the broader sense of the world, it's really not the case, right? You know, you, you know, we've probably all seen videos of cool robotics and everything, but I think it's important to remember that you know, um, this is a this is a very uh, micro is a is a microcosm of thought. And you know, coming out coming out of CMU, we really have to be kind of ambassadors and evangelists for this kind of optimistic, beautiful use of technology that is not really present as present as we might imagine it to be in, in this world that we live in here. And the one that came to mind was agency for me. Um, that things could seem to be moving so fast, you're always feeling behind, and you just want to do what the thing does. And I like to argue for agency, knowing that it's okay to say, okay, I'm gonna pause, and let me probably focus on this thing because I would learn so much from it that it would continue even if the tool changes. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, it's agency, because we have all, the, all these tools, but sometimes you could feel like you, you are being run by the tools, mm -hmm. um, but understanding that you can break the tool, you can choose not to get the tool, you can choose to get cheaper, shittier tools, like you have agency in how you engage yes. with these technologies. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk about materiality for a second. Maybe it's not switching gears, but maybe it is a little. Um, we are really talking about works that are at the intersection of code and things and light and practices and craft and uh, you know physical things and also non-physical things like movement or behavior. Um, and so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more in each of your practices about the um, the relationship, or how do you see materiality kind of ex exist in your practices? Yours is the most material, <laughs> and also the the most long term. You know, a lot of the work that you're doing for archival purposes, like there's a lot of immateriality in the material work that you do. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, so the question is around materiality. Um, one of the questions that I'm trying to uh, answer and ask this weekend uh, is around when it comes to digital tools and materiality um, and the thinking of context where the machine might not be there and how we use parts output from those machines as media mediators for almost telepathic ways of still engaging with, oh, I like that word, that word, that word just, um, it just struck me, remember that, okay? Um, <laughs> for a sort of telepathic way of engaging with machines materially. That's all I could say for now, my brain is still trying to figure it out, but my, my question is coming from uh, contexts that do not have access to these highly technological infrastructures and otherwise, and how we frame machine and engage with machines in ways that are forever context informed. Yeah. I've been thinking a lot about this. This, I, I, this year I've been on a sabbatical and I'm gonna keep it rolling too, that's nice. But I've been thinking about this, this question, both material, like I, I studied to be an architect when I was a freshman, I wanted to build stadiums and then like libraries and like oh installations and I was like software, like it's becoming more and more immaterial. But in reflecting this year, I see the similarity that I, I think maybe what I've been chasing this whole time is the sense of awe that you can feel in a space. Like when you step into a cathedral, you feel like you're just a very small part of the, the history, the narrative of that space. And with my, with my work, I think I'm also chasing that sense of awe, that I feel connected 
to something that's that's bigger than me, that's that's uh, more mysterious. As we, I've gotten a little more mystical, and and I'm a very rational person, and I'm trying to break that a little bit, and and just like go with the flow. But um, the the immaterial aspects of it is really is can I can I use space sound um, the spatial relationships like our proxemics to trigger senses of awe. That's that's kind of like been a challenge I've been going after. I, I was actually thinking something very similar. I am a very irrational person. In fact, I studied religion in undergrad, and um, <laughs> so I used to be more mystical like that. And now now I work in advertising. You're gonna, like, meet in the but yeah, but I, I would agree. I think like the the you know it's for me the things that like the driving components of a lot of the stuff that I'm interested in is like motion and color, mm -hmm. you know, and, and that that kind of traverses so much time-based media um, or, or static media as well. And I think that's what's always so attractive of your work is like the, it's, it's motion design, right? It, it's, it's such a core piece of it is like um, just the, it's a very nuanced and subjective, but like you, you know when it's good and it isn't. And it's cause like we all are still kind of working off our lizard brains, you know what I mean? And that's just like a, it's a really, the lizard brain is just a really easy target, and it's a fun target. And it's like, if personally, that's what kind of, that's the type of art that I'm personally interested in. And like people who have known this forever are animators and dancers, right? Like, like this is like, well, duh, and we're, and we're like, wow, we, we know this, we discovered this new thing. It's called motion. <laughs> <laughs> um, I want to talk about, you know, we're talking about the mystic and the sense of awe. Uh, how do we? How do you document your work to show that? And, and, and you know, it's not only in your work with awe, but I think in, in practices that are so embodied, I mean, I think, Ronell, you've worked a lot on capturing things that were tacit also. Um, so uh, how do we document? I use animated GIFs. <laughs> you, you make shape grammars <laughs> that, that begin to capture, you know, 50 years of craft knowledge into something that can be emailed and shared and archived. Isn't, isn't, yeah. I, I, I don't know if you know, but I love Renault's work. <laughs> I think you should answer all my questions because mm -hmm. you, you describe me. No, no, no. You describe me better than I describe myself. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, or I don't know as yet. I'm still thinking. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it, it's the hardest part of this kind of work, I think, because. Oh. Um, I, mean, I, can, I can speak for like light and projection, places that require a very uh, specific kind of environment to look good and to be experienced. It's really difficult to capture over video. It's easier on, with photography, um, but again, photography doesn't capture, it captures implied motion, but not actual motion, which is, you know, and gets you a little bit of the way there, but it's, it's hard. <laughs> it's, it's the worst part about it. I think all moves so what might be normal in one place would be awesome and inspire awe in another place. And so moving work around and the sharing that we do across whether it's geographies, fields, or whatever, I think those things inspire the awe, seeing things that are relatable but yet different I think that's what causes all. So let's keep moving the work around. Yeah. Okay. I feel like I'm getting to know you a little more. So now I can ask something further. <laughs> I All the work that we see, or not all the work, a lot of the work that you've shared is the accomplished work, right? It's the success. And I want to know the messy parts. Can you tell us the story of failure? Oh, I think part of being um, uh, someone who's creative and optimistic is having a really healthy relationship to rejection. Mm -hmm. And so, like last year, I was on sabbatical. I I also like you know applied for some jobs and didn't get them, and and uh, applied for grants and didn't get them. And I don't I can't even tell you where I applied or what it was because it just goes out of my mind so quickly, and it's just like on to the next. Healthy relationship with failure, rejection. Yeah. yeah. I am. Um, I, I didn't. I wasn't able to use for, to learn how to program until I was almost thirty, and I had gotten divorced, and I lived in a house, and I could just like spend every night in the basement smoking cigarettes and like learning how to program Arduino, 
And it wasn't until that point in my life that I had enough patience. Because like learning to program, kind of like any yeah. very technical craft, is like you have to be very comfortable with failure, mm -hmm. repetitive failure, and, and to be self-critical enough to be like, this isn't good, this isn't good yet, and oh, this it, it didn't compile again and again. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think what it's a really kind of trite thing to say, but like in, in this field that we're in, this creative field, like failure isn't, isn't really a thing, you know what I mean? Like it's just part of this ongoing continual process. It's a process, it's a process. Yeah, like your like, job, if you're doing research, your job is to fail, 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 keep on going, keep on trying. Yeah. Like it, that, that's experimental in nature. And, and if you don't fail, you're actually not doing a very good job. You're not pushing hard you're, enough. You're not pushing hard enough. And actually failure is where you find the cool things, right? I thought that this light and this diffuser were gonna look like this, but actually it looks like something much, much better that I couldn't have imagined it didn't, my renderer didn't tell me that it was gonna look like this. You know, it, it's, failure is kind of the way, is how you discover, you know. Bob Ross had it right. It's like those, those happy little accidents. You just gotta keep chasing, the, you have to put the work in, you have to do it to stumble across something that you weren't expecting. Like the project with the big orange robot, um, I was doing a project for my, my dissertation that w was not really, I was making that code to fabricate a garment on my body. And, and I'm still disappointed that I never actually ended up doing that project. But because I, I like to learn in public and, and that, that video went live on the internet, like that's how I got the op opportunity at the Design Museum in London was because I saw a YouTube video. And so putting things out there in the world, I, I, I'm very open about kind of just learning in public. And you know, you go to my website, if you look at like the Wayback Machine, my website, I change it all the time. My like, what I'm about changes all the time. And it's just constant tweaking and, and zigging and zagging and trying to keep a North Star Star, but being, being very comfortable navigating without a map. Uh, I would say one messy part that I could uh, talk about, you know, none of us do our work by ourselves. There are, there are people who, yeah. like, the work happens because of others. Um, on the human ethnographic side of the work, I think the messy part, in, in, in technical work, you could show technical documentation of your labors, right? Uh, in ethnographic work, you could show photos, you could show video, but there, there are hours and hours of video of, of labors that go unseen. Uh, there's the things happen in impromptu that you don't plan for, but what I love about those experiences are that they, um, they remind you that like my work would not be my work without the humans I interact with. So I can't be, okay, we need to do this now. No, if this is gonna take five hours instead of five minutes, the relationship is what decides the kind of data and information I get, um, which often is way more fun than rushing something in five minutes where you get to chat, you get to eat, you get to form real human connections that are the beautiful parts of it that you may not get a right on, but those things are fulfilling in ways that uh, the technical only and the rush, rush, rush to do things um, takes away from the awesomeness of life and what we do. Yeah. I'm gonna add to that. I, it, that is the messiest part for me. Like again, like I'm a, I work in client services, right? People pay us to like give them creative ideas and that's the hardest part of that job like creativity as a service like a really stupid thing but like you know <laughs> coming up with cool ideas and making them because um, you know we're not making it for ourselves in that context right we're making it for somebody else and and it's really hard it's definitely the hardest part of my job day to day is kind of working with kind of co communicating ideas and that not being understood so I think that's a very like creative services in the creative services world, that's an incredibly messy and really difficult. And that's probably where failures happen the most, is like failure of communication during process. And like how many pitches, you get one pitch out of 10, 20? Yeah, that we win. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. It's just the nature of it. Mm. How are we doing on time? Open to the room, yeah? Okay. raise your hand, I will go on the mic. Thank you for answering my questions. <laughs> Always get to be first, amazing. I want to return to Audrey's question about documentation. 
because it's something I struggle with as someone who's, I, to the extent that I get paid, I get paid for making papers, which is, I'm not trying to make papers, I'm trying to make things, and the papers are sort of the detritus of the process or whatever. Um, but to me, I think it, you know, if I could document this thing well in pictures and words, I'd be making pictures and words in the first place. Um, so I'm curious to what extent that documentation actually feels like part of the work to you, what, or you know, is it just sort of the thing you do for the clients? Um, because yeah, it's, it's, it's nearly impossible to document a, an experience of awe in words and pictures, at least for me, because I'm not a painter or an author or whatever, right? That's not actually the medium. Maybe this is a failure question. I don't know. I just remember that, Jake, you took the photos of those necklaces. I forgot about So my, my you have. Is, my wife is up there, too. Oh, Steph yeah, that's there. Steph. Steph I forgot there. about that. So you just have really talented friends. That solves all the problems for you. I remember, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we actually did that photo shoot in 214 upstairs. Yeah. Wow. Um, I, I think that's a great question. I, I see documentation as 100% as part of the work. So, and, and I think that that has. It's, it's how my work differs from more, I think, traditional arts world where the work is the work and it's meant to be experienced. I think about the work is gonna exist on YouTube. It's, the work is communicating an idea to as many minds as eloquently and as, as concise as possible. And the medium that I do that is with big giant machines, but the idea behind it is, is the work and, and it's my job to sort of communicate that in a way that others can begin to internalize and apply to their own, not, not to impose my view on them, but to spark a little something in them that, that ignites and grows. Um, I would say um, our paper writing that we have to do, it's call it what we do in the family, um, but there's a family outside, there's a public outside, and so I have a terrible memory, so documentation is really important for me to remember the things I've done. And when I look back on it, I see things in new ways, but also think of ways that I might use things that, are, that have not been edited as a way of engaging with, with publics. So uh, like my wirebenders have passed away, I have videos of them that I could now, like I could put online as a resource for others, right? Um, so thinking about there's work that we do in here, um, but there's more of us outside there than there are in here. And so how that documentation is for the majority. I, th I think a lot of the responsibility of, of also sharing this knowledge too, because it's needlessly complicated. It's, it's, all it does is it, it takes time, it takes patience, and a lot of people don't have the luxury of that. And so what I need to do is to make these, you know, I stand on the shoulders of many people who have made open source tools, that's how I learned. And so I do my best to, when I am able to master a piece of knowledge, to encode that and encapsulate it and share it as, as well as possible. And that, that's a lot of work. It's not fun, it's actually the least fun, but I think it's the most long lasting of the work. Yeah, I think for me, I've given up on the idea that one form of documentation can contain the whole project. And so I've just decided that I can multiply my forms of documentation. So maybe there's a paper, maybe there's also a pictorial, maybe there's also a poster and a demo, and then maybe there's a website and a zine. Some of you might be with me tomorrow. <laughs> and maybe there's a video, and there's also a, doc a short documentary about people's experience with the thing. And then there's video documentation of us fabricating the thing we made. And so I just, it's a lot of work, especially when you decide to do multiple things. But I think it helps relieve pressure when you decide that one thing won't do all of this. Hi, I, I don't actually have a question. I just want to add to the conversation in case other people have other experiences. Um, in, the, in the world of theater where I grew up, uh, it, it's interesting that we are technologists. We're not just designers. We're not just artists. The doing of the, 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 the thing that makes it happen, all of that work you're seeing, all the stuff on stage, all the movement that has to occur, all the costuming, the lighting, all of that is our technology. Uh, and it kind of hurts to hear this conversation about documentation because 
I, ju I grew up just doing the work and nobody ever pulled me aside. I never, you know, I, I started it before college, so nobody ever said, here, you really need to do this and document all, these, all this work that you're doing. That work goes on stage and you, ha you do have to experience it and it's gone. It's gone like forever. <laughs> There's no way to capture that sense of awe or that experience. And I was just listening to your conversation and relating to all these different aspects of what you're talking about, except the documentation part. There's no way to document the hundreds and hundreds of shows you know, that a person can work on in, in their lifetime and get across what they did. Uh, pictures don't do it. Video almost, it really doesn't do it. Uh, because it's a spatial, it has to do with motion through space and how we react to it and the volumetric, uh, the sense of volume that we get from the lighting. It has to do with the forms and how people move and what, what the words are, the content, you know what I mean? So I just wanted to kind of share that, what was that conversation that was going on in my brain because other people might be having it. Um, because we all kind of relate to what every every little aspect of what you guys are talking about. Thank you. Thank you to all of you for this. And this comment is for Madeline with a question, but I would love it if the whole panel would be interested in it. It's a wonderful exploration you've done and uh, the variations of uh, relationship that you've been playing with. I'm envious of the dance that you've had with these wonderful machines, and I'm tantalized by it all. Um, what I'm very, most curious about is some of the phrases you've used. You've said a nuanced understanding of human interaction, sorry, human intention, mm -hmm. forgive me. You also talked about going from control to connection. And of course, you had me at your title, which is Conversations with Machines. Can you say more about what those phrases mean and where you're going with those explorations? I, I think we communicate a lot with body language, how our body moves through space. And that's probably my bias is, is my architecture training, where you're given over the course of six years this hypersensitivity to how people move through space, what, spe what space does to a crowd of people. And so the work that I see is I just figured out a way of translating those sensibilities into these machines by, by programming them. And um, that, that to me is the, the novelty that I've been able to bring to this highly technical field by being an, an outsider to that field. Um, and the nuanced understanding is, is maybe just thinking about like, we think about our, our, our technology as uh, it has to behave all the time for us. And mm -hmm. uh, for the robot, for example, like if we're using robots on construction sites, we can't really program it through a computer. It's also like loud and dusty, right? We need to have these instinctive things that maybe if the robot is going to do something dangerous next to a person, it needs to sound like it is about to do something dangerous. So it triggers our instinct. And so what I'm very curious about is, I think it can be very productive to speak to those lower level frequencies that our brain can't turn off. That's not this higher level thinking that I have to ingest information, understand it, codify it, and act on it. But these instinctive things, and, and I think that body language of both us and, and machines is a good conduit of that conversation. Okay, um, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I'm a research assistant here. I graduated from the computational design program last year, so I'm working with um, Dara and Dina. So I think my question is that um, I also code like for machines and smaller scales like microcontrollers, but whenever I call for them, I was I would be looking for a certain behavior, like all or curiosity wanted to feel alive. But when I'm writing it, I know that that's my creation. Like I know it's my rational thinking, it's my logical thinking. And then even when I see its behavior back at me, I feel like it's discounted by that experience. So it's more like we're coding for experience for others instead of like, I, I'm not sure if it's making sense, but like this intersection of technology is almost like talking back at me. Like this is not real. Like maybe it's just like something you've tried to mimic from an artificial world, yeah. I wonder if you have thoughts on that. 
a hundred percent agree. Like the, the, the thing that, so I have this rational part of my brain is like, I programmed everything. Like when this thing does this thing, it's because I misprogrammed it or because it's doing exactly what I said. And yet when it's like tearing at me at seven meters per second, I can't help but be like, whoa, there's a dinosaur in front of me, you know? And so that I, what I found is, is when I'm making these machines, the first thing I do is get it moving as quick as possible. And a lot of the times it doesn't look lifelike. It's just responding to things. And then I build these tools that allow me to go in and kind of like tweak its brain and add a little bit of chaos, and then a little bit more chaos, and then a little more chaos, and then it's doing unpredictable shit, which can be dangerous, and so I tone it back just a little bit. And, and really, like, that's, when, that's where I see the, where you can suspend your disbelief, and you start to see this as actually lifelike in some ways. And you still have this rational side of your brain going on, but, but um, the primal lower frequencies of your body kick in and kind of take over at the same time. Thank you. I was going to just add, like, I think that's like the blessing and the curse of being like a little god when it comes to programming stuff that, you know, that moves and is like has personalities. It's like, you know, you're, you're never going to, it's never, it, it probably will never, never hit you the way that it hits someone who's seen it for the first time. And that's just kind of, kind of the curse of it, you know, it's like that, that that's just the reality of it. You're going to be seeing the, the, the guts of it all the time. I think I imagine that's the same for like, you know, motion uh, motion designers mm -hmm. or animators, right? When they see their work on the big screen, I'm sure they get flashes of kind of uh, emotion, emotional response. But probably the most of the stuff that they look at, and it's probably the same for anyone who's in a creative field. When they look at their work, they're not. Oh, ho, ho. it's more like, wow, I should have that. That <laughs> is not a right angle, and it should have been or yeah, something, yeah, you know. Yeah. But it's also like there's there's aspects of of my fingerprint that are on those machines. Like so, you look at all of them, and they're a little bit in your face, a little bit obnoxious, and and like kind-hearted in general, just like trying to trying to a little jovial, and that's kind of inseparable from from me. That's that's my DNA, the authorship in there, and I try to obscure that as much as possible, but also let it come. Like I haven't made a grumpy robot, and that's that's probably indicative of my personality. Okay, now I don't have a lot of reference points for um, work that's you know heavy on interacting with robots, but the one I do have is uh, Survival Research Labs, which was a performance troupe from the 80s who's, um, they basically took giant decommissioned like industrial and military equipment and then just made them fight each other in front of a live audience with very little safety oversight, and they did this for like decades somehow. And a core part of their, the experience that they wanted to bring out was the sense of fear, like just visceral, like shock you get from standing meters away from a machine that could like swing the wrong way and then lop your head off, like you're like st like staring right at a lion and you're you know just frozen, and seeing see seeing you on video stand next to those machines makes you wonder like are you ever afraid? Are the people that interact with these machines ever afraid? And do you have feelings about that? Yeah, definitely, hundred <laughs> percent. You know, like that. That's the that's kind of like the the taming aspect of it is really like this. There's things that we do. So this was done in a in a corporate artist residency for Autodesk, and I had to sit down with the health and safety uh, coordinator, and we had to look at a spreadsheet and take all of the red cells that were how I was going to die and turn them into green cells. And so for this, it was like, oh, what's your risk of, put a, put a numeric value on your risk of decapitation. And I'm like, well, I'll just operate it below my head and then I can't get decapitated. And it's like, <laughs> green cell, good job. Okay, what's next, right? And so there are things here, but, but for me, it's safety. Safety is part of the responsibility, especially with breathing life into these machines. They, they seem more intelligent than they are. And so for the design museum, and actually this next one, um, the, another good way of ensuring things are safe is having corporate partners. So ABB gave both the machine fencing and the robot. But for factories, you're allowed to have about a six inch gap or eight inch gap at the bottom. And that's fine for factory. But in a museum setting where there could be a toddler crawling around, right? So I had to be the one to catch that and to say, hey, we need this machine fencing all the way to the ground, right? And it was something that, that um, I'm incredibly grateful that I, I thought of at the time. And, and there, there are no real checks on that because we're, we're taking these things 
out of their normal setting. But it's, as a, it's, it's my responsibility to ensure that safety and to get buy-in from all the people involved. Like, no one wants, you're like, maybe, maybe those guys are, want to play with decapitation. I don't. I'll just operate it a little lower below, below my head. Um, so based off of what you mentioned, it sounds like you came into the field of uh, these large-scale robots at its preliminary stages, and you were able to produce really groundbreaking work by humanizing these robots. And I'm curious, for those of us who are currently, um, currently in school, currently graduating, how do we continue to innovate in the way that you did at your time? Um, how do we move forward with this? Is it a matter of application or scale or capability? Um, how do we continue to push these boundaries from an artistic perspective? Where do you see this going? I think for me, it, it, it um, I'll go to another visual. So it, like for me, it, it started all right here. So the first thing you're taught when you work with robots is don't touch them. And so the first thing we did was we made a back massaging robot, right? And, and there's aspects of this is like, um, of really, I, I think the way of, of productive operating is here, is what are the narrative that we're getting handed with this technology, and how can we misuse it in more interesting ways? And that can be applied to like big expensive machines that are really hard to get access to because chances are you might break the big expensive machine, or our invisible systems that are around us, our large language models, our AI systems, right? We have to, a lot of the creativity that we can bring is just thinking differently about what we're being fed for how these tools can be used and being able to be more strategic and apply them in ways that are, are more pushing us towards the direction that we would like the future to go in. Hey, um, so I'm more familiar with Madeline and Vernell's work, but I'm interested, this might actually be applicable to everybody. I was thinking a little bit about uh, another person's question with regards to like a facsimile of life versus sort of actually making life as opposed to, yeah, just sort of aping it. Um, but really thinking about this materiality and like the real world being a way in which you can build or like allow for those sort of happy accidents. Like I, I believe with Mimas, it was working at a different, uh, upload speed, so that's part of the reason it had so much jerky motion, or like oh, that's, working. That's a deep cut, you know that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, or thinking about um, an early cybernetics sculpture, Senster by, um, uh, I forget his name now. Edward Inakowitz. Edward Inakowitz. Um, and that it can sometimes appear much more complex because you're working with, you know, the reverberations of a big you know, not acoustic room, or you know, you're working with all these things that happen because of the hardware, because of the upload speed of your thing. So I'm wondering also, like, how do you then work across these sort of unpredictable aspects of working with a material and working with sort of the likelihood of not exactly failure, but just unpredictable motion, especially with you know the kinds of technology always kind of not always, but Frequently, I feel like technology is moving towards more and more simulation, more and more like working in CAD or working in you know, simulation. So how do you balance that and how do you move across those things with any of this materiality? I try to roll with it. And, and I think that's like with the design training, you sort of learn that constraints are, are a blessing in some of these things. And, and it, it can trigger the most creative, innovative solutions around like, like this whole idea of, of personality of this robot um, I, didn't, I didn't intend it to be that, but it looks like excited and nervous because I had to use this other communication protocol that would only allow me to send four commands per second instead of 250 for the smooth motion in the later ones, right? And so you just lean into it and you go with it. And, and it's, um, I feel like it's my job to not just be the engineer, but also be the Jane Goodall kind of observing what's happening and tuning into the same frequencies to see what the creative potential is. So I try to, I do my best to make something that moves, put it out in the world, get feedback, and then step back and reflect and, and see what I'm not looking, stepping away from it, coming back to it, and to, to um, try to be open to it going in different directions that I didn't intend from the onset. Great, we have time for one more question, and then after that, Dara will have some notes before you leave. First hand. Oh, right behind me. 
Uh, this is specifically to Madeline, but I want to open it to everybody. Thinking about the companies that you um, need to work with in order to do things at this scale, and you're such a really um, practiced, and I think even like slick is an appropriate word, uh, presenter about how you do your stuff. Can you talk about how you strategize getting their support, whether or not you show all of the things you're thinking about, if you try to gauge what they want in order to do what you would like? It's a little bit of give and take. I think like you look at my work and it's optimistic, it's, it's human-centered for this technology that's very alienating and communication departments really like that. And communication departments have a discretionary budget and that need to spend quarterly. And so there's an alignment there that, that um, I try to walk the line between uh, like shilling some corporate... Um, line like like spoken line like this is what we're all about it's sun, sunshine and rainbows all the way down and and being true to some of the the curiosity that i have um and a lot of the work that i do i i think about just how what the potential impact of it can be so so taking something to a museum where a hundred thousand people see it and for like the kids who were were seeing this like for them a, a robot is something that should be responsive and attentive and kind and curious. And is that benefit of that potential um, a work with the the partners that I'm that I'm doing with? For this one, it was ABP and it was Autodesk and, and the Design Museum itself. I don't work a lot with industry partners, but I have gotten grants from the government. And I think that there is a similar um, there's a parallel to make between how do you articulate what you really think the contribution of the work could be. And I think there is a real, and I think it's a really good practice to figure out the wording that works for you to explain what's the value of doing research through art or research through design. And so I think that it takes a long time to figure out how to phrase it, but I think that there is space for that if you explain it very plainly and directly. I would add one more thing because you know I think deep deep local is an interesting place. Like I don't think people at deep local like love marketing. I mean I think some people do, but like what really most of the people at deep local really love is making like big like getting we get we get we get like huge budgets right. Like we do like really big expensive stuff and you know like Google pays for it and it's kind of in the guise of marketing. But I think the thing that like the, the thing that like I've come to terms with over the last five ten years is like. You know, it's okay to be a little BSy. Like, it's okay to like, like. Sometimes you have to sell. You know, like, and like sometimes you have to like. There's a there's a there's a really healthy dose of like being honest about what you do, but also like, you know, like kind of doing this to people's <laughs> face a little bit, and 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 also finding, like, finding people who are already on board with what you're doing to like evangelize for you, right? So to unlock the big box, like. No one's gonna hand you a check. Like they have to go talk to their boss and their boss, and like you don't get to talk to their boss. And so finding the person who's like already kind of into it, and just like kind of, you know, talking to them directly is like the move. I mean, that's that's that's, that's how we do it. <laughs> I think a framework that I use is is how do I get a win-win-win? So I get something, you get something, and we do something together that we couldn't have apart. And that that's kind of what I try to shoot for when I engage with with external entities. <laughs> Dinner. <laughs> All right. Um, that is going to bring our kind of our first evening of this wonderful weekend of conversations with machines to a close. And um, I think most importantly, I'd love to just kind of recognize our wonderful panel and our wonderful workshop leads. <laughs> Thank you all.